Greetings. I'm Marilyn Summers. I'm the director of the Center for Global Women's Health at University of Pennsylvania, and I'm also a professor at the School of Nursing. We know that urban environments present both opportunities and risks for women, and this panel will focus on some of those risks and opportunities. When you look at the opportunities, certainly, um, arguably, access to, access to healthcare might well be easier in an urban environment. There are other opportunities as far as education and jobs in an urban environment that women in very rural areas might not experience. But we know that there are also significant risks. Um, crowded living, living in unsafe neighborhoods, um, traffic risks, not trafficking, but uh, transportation risks because the amount of traffic on the highways, uh, the stress of, co of navigating complex environments, uh, and especially if, if there's a lack of resources as you try to navigate those complex environments, and that leads to stresses in relationships and interpersonal violence. So um, I'm very honored to have three esteemed uh, speakers today to talk about some of these issues in this session, which is Invisible Walls, Women, Violence, and Safety. I'm going to give them abbreviated inter uh, introductions that have nothing to do with my esteem for them and their wonderful accomplishments, because I want you to be able to um, listen to what they have to say. Um, our first speaker is Addie Namanthi, who is the Adrian Mosley Endowed Chair of Community Health Research and Distinguished Professor and also the Associate Dean for International Research and Scholarly Activities at the UCLA School of Nursing. Um, she's very well known for her work with vulnerable populations, for um, thinking about marginalized women and youth and how they manage the stigma of uh, conditions such as HIV and homelessness. Dr. Mananthi. Thank you. Well, I wanted to wish you all a most good afternoon and uh, express the passion that I have for the work that I do with uh, probably the most vulnerable of women. These are women who are homeless, perhaps using drugs, those who have been incarcerated and at risk for recidivism. And I will also touch upon the work that we are doing with women in India. Uh, these do happen to be rural women, but suffer from the horrendous illnesses of HIV and AIDS. And as we've heard all morning, there are so many um, issues in terms of needs and risks that we um, are hearing more and more about. In the work that we do, we definitely focus on uh, the socioeconomic issues of finances, of ethnicity, and of gender. We are very interested in situational issues that have to do with being homeless, history of victimization and history of abuse that you've heard uh, Angela and the um, previous speakers speak so eloquently about. Um, personal issues that have also been touched upon, for example, how women feel about themselves, their feelings of self-esteem that you also saw in the movie that is so important, as well as social support, which is vital for all of us. And all of these factors we know are so important in terms of how women cope with the, the stresses that they have, uh, their level of emotional distress, and also uh, their behaviors in terms of whether they're going to go into drug and alcohol use to try to abate these feelings, or, um, how, or, or the other risk factors and outcomes, for example, having HIV and AIDS or recidivism as a negative outcome. In terms of homeless women in particular, we know that two-thirds of these women have a history of substance abuse. And we also know that women that have lower social support are more likely to drink alcohol to the point of intoxication. We also know that whereas women who have high social support, what we find that it is very protective in terms of uh, improving access to care, improving de uh, depressive symptoms, greater use of coping, and lower emotional distress, and of course the opposite. Um, I just have one slide that I always like to show, and uh, let's see if I can get this on. Yeah, th this is where the doctoral students slide under the table. <laughs> but, but in actuality, it's very simple, because what it shows, this is sexual um, risk behavior, that these, uh, these factors are so important for us to focus on. It actually guides our research, and it comes from our research. And so what it shows is that self-esteem is is negative, negatively related to the outcome of unprotected sex. We need to focus on self-esteem. We need to improve uh, social resource to improve coping 
which is uh, the higher the coping, the less the AIDS risk behavior. And you find the same things in terms of drug use behavior, where appraisal of threat is so dangerous and it leads to ineffective coping, which leads to uh, drug use behavior and also sexual behavior. So the, this framework allows us to highlight and to guide us in terms of the intervention that we need to focus on, improving self-esteem, improving social resources, uh, improving uh, social support, all of these things are critical. As we move now to our uh, uh, work that with women on parole, we know that it is the, absolutely the next group that's uh, moving forward and becoming much more increasing uh, in, in prevalence, women being incarcerated. And in our study that we are actually in our third year of a five-year study with men on parole, uh, the women almost immediately came to us and said, what about us? What about the women? We need you to write a grant and to help us as well, just like you're working with the men. Um, in, in order to provide a little statistics, just like we heard just a few minutes ago, as many as 75 to 95 percent of women who have been incarcerated have experienced uh, violence, interpartner violence. And many of them now are facing the scars of this abuse and victimization that they've seen. All of which, again, profoundly affects their self-esteem, their feeling that they could cope with the, pri uh, with the crisis and unfortunately leads to the negative outcomes that we've talked about. The statistics tell us that nearly half of women who have been in prison are reincarcerated within one year, almost half. This is a tragedy, and we need to all work together to make a difference in terms of improving the factors that we just talked about. Self-esteem, a lot of the programs that you just mentioned are exactly what's necessary to do. In, uh, in a little segue, I wanted to talk about the work that Dr. Heilman, who recently had to leave, and myself, uh, worked with a doctoral student, uh, now Dr. S uh, uh, Susan Stemmler, in her work it was with pregnant women who were using methamphetamine. And unfortunately, about 42% of all women who use drugs are using methamphetamine. And it's sad from the, the narratives that she got from her qualitative study that uh, the women that are using were initiated, were introduced to methamphetamine by trusted friends, family members. And among uh, a much smaller group of 12 to 14 year olds, uh, they were using methamphetamine to numb the feelings of childhood traumas that we just talked about, molestation, rape, et cetera. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of these women are all at high risk for sexually transmitted disease and other issues as well. But the crux of her dissertation was uh, the fact that they were pregnant. And it was very uh, sad and unfortunate to know that many of these women either denied their pregnancy for as long as they could, some of them didn't even recognize the fact that they were pregnant, and many of them had such great fear that they never went to health care because of fear of being stigmatized, because of being pregnant and using drugs. Um, and as we all know, the outcome of this is uh, placentia ab abruption, preeclampsia, uh, low gestational age babies who are at very high risk for neurologic uh, issues. So a lot of work needs to be done on the women who are most stigmatized, and that, uh, that is women who are pregnant and using drugs. Now, in focus group assessments that we did with the women who came to us uh, from a residential drug treatment facility, um, we, uh, of course, uh, heard about all the factors that they say cause them to recidivate. These are the factors that we need to work on. Unstable housing, we've heard this already. Uh, unemployment, lack of social support, lack of access to health care, all these issues are essential for uh, these women so that they don't go back. And in, in providing a small quote of, of what these women are saying to us, I have uh, just a small quote here. 
what the one woman was saying is there is a need for a phone number where I can call and talk to someone so that they can help me stay on the right road. These are for women who are now getting ready to leave their safe haven, their residential drug treatment that they went into right after prison. Once you leave residential drug treatment, you don't really have nothing to look forward to. You don't have nowhere to go. Like me, uh, many of these women do not have a family that they can stay with. Here, a lot of women take off after completing residential drug treatment with men that they hardly know uh, because they have nowhere to go. And they end up using drugs again. So these women, worked very hard in helping us to, to write a, a small NIH grant, which we received a, a, a good score, and we're ready to get back in again. But this grant is so powerful, and keeping my fingers crossed that we would get funded, because it follows these women uh, in the drug treatment program where we get to meet them and work with them for a few months and then follow them out into the community when their needs are the highest, where they need to be with somebody. They need the, the support. They need the nurse case management. They need the uh, advocacy. All these things that we talked about is what, what this grant would provide. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to talk about, just for one minute, the work that we're doing in India. And it's interesting in India, the most, uh, the highest risk factor for most of the women that are rural is being married, unfortunately, with huge issues in, front, in, in terms of stigmatization. And as uh, one woman told us, the only time she feels safe to take her medication is when she's giving her child a bath and she sips the bath water as she takes her medication. That's the only time she could take it. And so with the guidance of these women uh, from focus groups, from our community advisory board, they helped us design a study which was NIH funded for three years, just recently completed, where we had uh, tremendous outcomes. Um, their adherence to, to their antiretroviral medication went from 46%, this was equal in the control group and the intervention group, to 99.6%. And this intervention was based on training lay village women to partner with nurses to provide um, the education. And um, what you see here behind me are the actual women who were just beginning to come into our program, the intervention program. And you could see, except for the woman in white, who's one of the lay village women, the, the women are so destitute. You, you could look in their eyes and see how sick they are, how poor they are. And part of our intervention was providing life skills and, and providing the ability to, to, um, to become tailors, to, be, to embroider, to do all the things that these women wanted to do. It was their choice what they wanted, which we helped them to do. And, and now you could see, um, this woman behind the sewing machine, um, uh, she, she has a better outlook uh, and, and feels good and significant improvements, not only in adherence, but in weight gain and all the important things, emotional health and all the things that are important. We evaluate it, and now uh, we are very, very close. We, we've been funded by NIH for a very large five-year study to go back to India and to work not only with the women now, but the families who they were most likely sharing the food that we, they were providing. So families and their husbands and their children. So a much bigger study that we hope will, will come in. So in summary, uh, I just wanted to emphasize that, that all of us today have spoken about the needs of women. And uh, nurses and interdisciplinary partners can do fabulous research studies that will actually model the, the, the kinds of services that we need to provide and actually measure outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Gert. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. That was fascinating. Um, our next speaker is Kay Buck. She's the executive director and CEO of the Coal Col Coalition to Abolish Slavery and Trafficking, or CAST. Kay has nearly 20 years of experience in the human rights field. Um, 
At the state, national, and international levels, she joined CAS in 2003 and leads the longest-running anti-slavery organization in the nation. We look forward to your comments. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Great. I like that, an interactive uh, audience. That's good. <laughs> So uh, actually, my journey here uh, today started well over a decade ago, if you can believe it, before this conference was even planned. And uh, I'm going to open up with that before I tell you a little bit about the model that we use to provide services, uh, empowerment services, to survivors of human trafficking or what's known as modern day slavery. Um, and I'm going to tell you about the journey because it is why I'm here today. Um, well over a decade ago, a young woman uh, who was 16 at the time from Indonesia was recruited to come here for a better life or what she thought would be a really great job so that she could send money home to her family and so that she could get an education. And it turned out when she got here that she was enslaved as a domestic servant for several years and uh, she was, I won't go into um, too much about the violence and the trauma, but you can all imagine how she was beaten every day and degraded. And I loved the comments about self-esteem, because I really think it's a theme in today's conference, how she was degraded so much that she felt like dogs had more rights uh, in this country than she did. In fact, many times uh, in our cases at CAS, traffickers say that to their victims, that animals in this country have more rights than they do as domestic servants or as uh, women forced into prostitution in brothels or massage parlors or in sweatshops. So she just couldn't take it anymore after years, and it actually took her over three months to write a note, just a small note, that she learned to write in English from uh, children's books. That's how she learned to write in English. Passed it through a fence to a nanny or housekeeper next door. And that family, uh, the person who's actually uh, in the audience today and why I'm here today, helped her. They rescued her from that household, from a life of slavery. And they called us and, and uh, took this young woman, whose name is Ema, to our shelter. And she stayed with us for two years, learning how to empower herself. And I, I want to say this story, because she was actually here this morning and helped set up our table outside. And uh, she's now working full time at CAST as our survivor organizer. And uh, I want to point out, she was also recognized uh, by President Obama in September of this year at the Clinton Global Initiative, where he made a president for the first time uh, in a long time, uh, made a speech about modern day slavery and what this country needs to do to fight it. So um, with that, uh, I'm going to tell you more about the services that we provide at CAST. But I wanted to tell you that story because it's here in the room with us. It does exist here in Los Angeles, in urban centers, all over this country, all over the world. And even though modern day slavery is illegal everywhere, it happens everywhere. That's the reality. So um, CAST actually got started in the mid-90s after, for those of you who've lived in LA for a long time, um, uh, you've probably heard of the infamous El Monte sweatshop case that happened, where 72 people from Thailand were enslaved for seven years. And um, that's how we got started. The community was outraged, as they should be. And I hope I mm -hmm. am able to instill a little bit, bit of that outrage, outrage in you today so we can together, uh, after today, do some things together to end modern-day slavery, not just here in L.A., but all over the world. And, um, you know, CAST got started as a very small grassroots organization. Uh, we were started by ethnic community-based organizations, prosecutors of the El Monte case, and our founder, Dr. Catherine McMahon, who was ac in academia. So it was this very rich collaboration of community that started our organization. And what we're about, basically our model is very simple. It is that we take a survivor-centered approach to ending modern-day slavery. 
What that means is that we have a wellness center uh, where we work with um, medical clinics, we work with um, vocational service programs, uh, we have case managers, attorneys, and um, advocates on staff who provide direct services that is focused on an empowerment model to survivors. And after that, after they graduate from the program, which usually takes about 18 months to two years, they then can enter a leadership development program where they're learning media advocacy, policy advocacy, health policy, and they're making changes. So today, we now have laws in the state of California and in the country because survivors are using their voices to speak out. And they're using more than their voices. They're using their expertise as subject matter experts. And so that's the model of CAST. It's about empowering survivors to actually work in partnership with us. It's not so much a, an agency-client relationship, but rather a partnership so that they are part of the solution. So I'm thinking today uh, that many of you think, well, sure, this maybe happens once in a while here, but it happens more in the developing world. It does, but it also happens a lot in the United States. And in fact, Los Angeles is one of the top three destination cities where traffickers bring victims. One of the top three cities. And I want to show you a visual, because I'm very a visual person, and I think this might help. But these are actually four locations of a case that uh, we handled recently. Uh, it was all the same case, but the traffickers, uh, of which there were five, four women and one man, the traffickers, trafficked more than 10 women and girls from Guatemala to Los Angeles. And these apartments and these homes are actually makeshift brothels. Mm. That's what they were. And um, I show this to you because it does happen all over the city. These particular locations happen to be in the mid Wilshire and Koreatown area of town, but uh, we've had cases in uh, very affluent hotels in Beverly Hills where uh, the victims are here on vacation with the traffickers. Uh, we've had cases in very affluent areas in West Los Angeles, in Culver City, really in every neighborhood. And so I point this out to show that it, it really is happening in our, our very own backyard, in our own neighborhoods. I also want to show this visual where uh, this is the inside of one of those locations, one of the brothels I just showed you. And in this particular case, as I said, the women and girls from Guatemala were actually shuttled around by a taxi driver who was hired by the traffickers to take the women and girls from place to place to visit the, the Johns or, or the customers, um, for lack of a better term. And in one of the locations uh, where the girls in particular were being raped every day, you can see teddy bears on top, that was where their toys, on top of the dressers where they were actually forced to prostitute. And the doors were all blocked and locked, as were the windows. So they really could not get out. And I bring this up because a board member of mine at CAST, when she saw the pictures, uh, uh, this particular picture, she was shocked because one of her friends actually has an apartment in one of these places. And he didn't know what was going on. So that's how close to home it really can be. So, I also, I know it's a new issue for maybe some of you um, uh, to be aware that it's happening here in the United States. So I, I just wanted to leave you with some statistics. I'm not a fan of statistics myself, but I think it's important given that this issue is an emerging one for the women's community, for the human rights community. And um, you know, there's statistics that say anywhere from 12 to 27 million people are actually enslaved at this time worldwide, 12 to 27 million. It is the fastest growing criminal enterprise. In fact, now, today, it's tied with the arms trade. So it's just behind drug trafficking. At least half of the survivors uh, that are identified worldwide are children. And in our case, about 80% are women and girls here in Los Angeles. Victims are enslaved in domestic servitude, 
uh, brothels, as I said before, factories, restaurants, pretty much anywhere in the service industry, and agriculture, among others. Our youngest survivor that we've, whom we served is three. The eldest is 65. So it really gives you a picture of what we're looking at. And according to the annual trafficking in persons report, which is put out by the US State Department each year, it says that um, you know, it's a multi-dimensional threat, this emerging issue of modern day slavery. And it is because it deprives people of their basic rights and freedoms. It also increases global and local community health risks, and it fuels the growth of organized crime. So that's why we need to pay attention to it today. Um, I talked a lot about uh, our model, our empowerment model, and how we, we work in partnership with survivors. And um, I just wanted to uh, leave you today with a story of a woman who was trafficked into a sweatshop here in LA a few years ago. Um, and now she's an active advocate. Uh, with the National Survivor Network that CAST convenes. And in fact, the young woman I spoke of earlier from Indonesia, Ima, uh, manages that project for CAST. And so she communicates with survivors from all over the country, and they develop an annual legislative or advocacy agenda. And one of the things that Ima and this woman, Floor, did was uh, they um, were able to pass uh, state legislation that allows for immediate health benefits as well as other benefits when survivors are first identified in the state of California. And that's really important because we were finding that the survivors we were identifying had to wait sometimes a year before receiving any type of protections or, or health benefits. So it goes to show how this empowerment model really does work and how the, the survivor-centered approach to ending modern-day slavery is, uh, is a worthwhile investment. So I'm going to leave you because I don't like talking to groups about this type of, of trauma and um, violence without giving you hope and something to do. So we have a sheet out on our table outside that gives you 27 things that you can do as soon as you leave this conference today to help us, modern day, help us end modern day slavery here in LA and globally. Um, and I also just want to do a shout out to our partner, Dr. Susie Baldwin, who couldn't be here today, but she is with the County of Public Health and um, she actually has been a real mover and shaker for us in developing health uh, systems that accommodate specifically survivors of human trafficking. And so we do training um, for health practitioners and we work with this amazing nurse practitioner and team so that um, the survivors we see locally get trauma-informed care. So I look forward to talking with you more um, after the session. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We, we will tackle the 27. We have enough people in this room that we should be able, if we, if we each just take one, we still should be able to do a good job. It's indeed a pleasure to be able to um, introduce a colleague. Uh, when, when you work with someone day to day, uh, you don't always get the chance to be on the podium to acknowledge their good work. So um, our next presenter is Ann Teitelman. Anne is the Patricia B. Snack Silverstein and, Hil and Howard Silverstein Endowed Term Chair of Global Women's Health. She's an associate professor at the School of Nursing. Um, she's also a, a colleague in both our Center for Health Equity and our Center for Global Women's Health. Uh, and I have admired her work ever since I walked in the door in 2006 at the University of Pennsylvania. She's going to talk about empower empowering risk, uh, uh, empowering uh, risk. Uh, no, empowering girls to reduce their risks uh, and really has a, a very important program of research and clinical practice focusing on uh, at-risk girls and women. Anne. Thank you. Um, so I'll, um, I'll move along so we uh, can get to lunch pretty soon. But anyway, um, I'll be talking with you about my research with adolescent girls in our cities, their sexual health and their relationships. Uh, which is often an invisible uh, situation, but I'm so glad our colleagues from the Genesee Center had, had highlighted some of the important issues there. Okay. But first I want to situate our urban girls who are de living in the decaying sectors of our cities with loss of good jobs and generations of discrimination and poverty within urban families that are fragmented and yet resilient. 
in neighborhoods where they are surrounded by violence, where young men cannot find jobs but can find uh, work in the underground economy with incarceration and death as occupational hazards. Needless to say, girls growing up in these physical and social environments have limited choices and opportunities and compromised health and safety. In my research, I start by gathering the stories of girls and young women. And this is the story of Gina. He was chasing her for a year from the age of 12, and then at 13, she finally gave in and she fell in love. He was 19. She wanted to use condoms, but he told her that she was his girl, and so she should not worry about using protection. Also, when he hit her, she thought that showed how much he cared for her. At 14, after the baby was born, she still wanted to be in a relationship with him. But after a while, she found out she had gonorrhea, and she finally gave up on him. Now, at age 24, Gina thinks what might help young girls like her would be a place where girls could gather together with some trusting adults maybe fix up an abandoned home someplace, because when she was young, she didn't have anyone to talk to. Gina's story echoes through our cities. In the US, overall, about half of high school age girls have had sex, but in our cities, that reaches over 60%. Among urban adolescent girls who have had sex, many have older partners, and this is associated with decreased condom use. Adolescent girls across the United States, you look at the rates, it's about 9% reports of dating violence, but in our cities that approximates closer to 30%. And our cities are particularly hard hit in areas where there's um, low, low resources and in, particularly in households where there's economic distress. So urban girls living in these distressed communities often have less power in their relationships and are therefore at an extreme disadvantage in safer sex negotiations. And that might explain why adolescent girls ages 15 to 19 have the highest rates of gonorrhea and chlamydia of all ages, both genders. This is the story of Erica. She was 14 when they met. He was overprotective and that made her feel safe in the neighborhood where there was a lot of violence. But he wanted to control almost everything and yelled at her a lot and sometimes grabbed her during arguments. She carried condoms with her and, he, and she made him wear them, but he took them off during sex. That's how she got pregnant. She had long suspected he had other partners. However, after she found out he had a sexually transmitted infection, she didn't want to talk to him and she didn't want him to touch her and he got mad and he forced her to have sex. Now at age 22, she says the arguments with abuse was the way it was supposed to, she thought that was the way it was supposed to happen because that's what she saw all around her growing up. She thinks teen girls need to know that healthy relationships involve trust and respect they need to understand the warning signs of abuse and they need to know uh, how to uh, develop healthy relationships and they need adults or, or peers teaching groups of girls. Erica's story is not unique. About 12% of girls in the US have experienced forced sex and that's probably an underestimate. 50% of girls diagnosed with a sexually transmitted infection or HIV have a history of either sexual or physical violence. In fact, in the U.S., about 12% of HIV among women is directly attributable to partner violence. And we know that our urban areas are particularly hard hit by HIV, uh, as our large cities have the highest prevalence. HIV is now one of the leading causes of death for young adult women, and they were likely infected during adolescence. So what does all this mean? Well, when adolescent girls are held back, that ripples through all of society. But if she can safely navigate through adolescence, not only will she benefit, but so will her family and community for generations to come. So what can we do? Well, this is one small step, but one thing my research team and I have been doing is to provide girls we know now with effective interventions and create safe spaces. So my research team, in collaboration with our community partners, have created an advocacy and an empowerment intervention for adolescent girls called Stand Up Together in which we work with them on the knowledge and skills they need to prevent HIV and other, and, um, and, and, and other sexually transmitted infections and learn how to recognize and avoid unhealthy relationships and build healthy relationships. We also talk with them about gender norms, power dynamics in relationships, and also how to help a friend in an abusive relationship. So the intervention lasts about 10 hours in small groups of girls. We run it over three weeks. It's a variety of activities that they like, fun games, videos, comic books, role plays. We evaluated it before and three months later with surveys and qualitative interviews, 
And I'll just give you a couple uh, samples of some of the quotes they told us three months after the intervention. One girl said, now I make sure my boyfriend respects me and I know about his personality before I start a relationship. Another one said, she learned about standing up for herself, sticking to your decision, don't let anyone change your mind. Another girl said, we broke up because after the intervention, I realized he was possessive and rude and I realized it just wasn't healthy. So one of the things we taught them was to put their boyfriend on three months probation before they uh, had <laughs> sex with them. Just like you hire somebody from a job. And we said, you know, you gotta get to know somebody because you're making really big decisions about sex and if you're doing that in a relationship where you don't really know who this person is, probably it's not gonna turn out very well. And, and so we were very pleased with some of these uh, responses that they were taking that to heart and really following that. Um, so not only did they learn a lot, they also told us that they really liked the time they spent together and they wanted to meet, they wanted to continue to meet and were thinking about ways to continue the work and continue meeting and I love your idea about having them be the advocates, so I, I think we'll think about that too. Um, the initial statistics are very promising, it looks like it, the intervention is effective at reducing HIV risk and partner violence. So I'm optimistic because I've seen these girls are eager to learn and to find solutions and that they care about each other. And I'm confident that if we include girls in developing the solutions, we can continue to revitalize our urban areas as so many people have talked about today and make them safe places to live and work and learn and promote gender equity within them. Um, and then I think our urban girls will have more choices and resources and, and resilience. And I think then we will have a recipe for long lasting change. Thank you. So one of the, the statements that Jacqueline Levitt said earlier really struck me as a theme across all these, and that was the art of listening. Uh, and Dr. Namathi, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the methods that scholars use uh, so that they can incorporate the art of listening and particularly community methods uh, that you can really hear the voices of the people uh, that you are studying to learn from them. Yes, I think that uh, we call it community partnered, community based partnerships, um, participatory action research. There are many terms for it, but we have all heard it today that what's most critical is to listen to what the women are telling us and to uh, help them not only uh, to uh, participate in the actual intervention, but to help you design the intervention, design all aspects of it, including uh, helping us to evaluate the interpretation of the outcomes. So I think that that is something that all of us in, our, in this room need to be mindful of, is that the only way that we can truly be successful in the uh, action of research is to engage the targeted group and to bring them into all different aspects of the research. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Buck, you were very um, articulate about the, the current issues that we have in trafficking and that it is indeed an issue for us all in all of our cities, but what do you project in the next decade might be the issues that we're going to have to face? Oh, uh, that's a good question because uh, even though human trafficking has been happening here and around the world for a very long time, it's a relatively new issue in terms of our awareness of it. So, um, like for example, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, which is the federal statute um, that allows for protections of survivors, prosecutions of traffickers, and prevention initiatives here and around the world, really just passed in two, the year 2000. So we're 12 years old as a movement, if you think of it that way. So the next decade, I think, will bring uh, a lot more awareness. We're already seeing that where, as I said before, uh, our president uh, made a whole speech about modern day slavery and what we're going to do to end it. Forbes magazine just um, wrote an article about human trafficking and featured cast in it, came out two weeks ago. The media is getting involved, uh, documentaries and movies are being made about the issue. So there's going to be more awareness. And I specifically predict after this conference that more health practitioners will get involved and uh, pick up that 27 things to do yes. sheet outside, but to call us locally so that we can develop even more clinics around town so that um, survivors really do have trauma-informed care and access to, to health care that they so deserve. Um, 
And then one last thing, I think uh, we're going to see more of an advocacy emphasis on the role of foreign labor recruiters. And I bring this up because it's an industry that pretty much goes unregulated at this point. And what we're finding is that five years ago, um, survivors were being charged by basically the labor brokers, the foreign labor brokers, about $2,000. Then they would say, we'll take care of your visa, your, your flight, everything. You don't have to worry about a thing. Just give me your identification and I'll take care of it. And then, of course, when they get here, they find out that it's not a dream job and it's a nightmare instead. Mm -hmm. okay. And what we're finding now is that $2,000 fee has now skyrocketed to $30,000. We just had a case recently where each victim was charged $30,000, and uh, that creates a situation of debt bondage. And so uh, what that means is that they're taking loans out in their communities by loan sharks and sometimes family members, and especially with loan sharks, that puts their children and families in danger in their communities back home. So I think that we're going to see more legislation and advocacy around this industry of foreign labor recruitment. And I find the links between the community-based methods and, and the methods you're using to successfully try to get a handle on this is very compelling. It seems yeah. like you're both doing the same things. I think all three of us, yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, absolutely. And I think uh, what we forget sometimes is that uh, teenagers can be involved in the research. Right. Mm -hmm. And we can do participatory action research with teenagers. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we forget that. We, we only include adults. So. Yeah, good point. This is a question for Kay. What is, what happens to these victims relative to the INS? Yeah, good question. <laughs> so uh, that's where a lot of our training has been done uh, over the last decade. And um, I don't want to sit here and say that it's a perfect system because many survivors and actually NGOs or non-governmental organizations um, working with survivors still fear deportation. And so we have a long stretch to go in training, um, in training INS or what's called DHS now or ICE, they're called, um, to make sure that they're seeing victims as um, victims and not criminals. The same goes for, um, you know, programs serving juveniles, where we also have a, a sizable domestic population, so girls who are actually U.S. citizens or legal permanent residents who are trafficked. And L.A. is a big hub for this because they think they're coming here to be a model or to work in Hollywood, and the pimps take advantage of that. And we still have situations where law enforcement sees them as criminals, meaning prostitutes, and not victims of human trafficking. So we have come a long way. I want to say that our local law enforcement is really great, and I can say that wholeheartedly. Um, we've trained them. They've opened up their doors to be trained. We have in Los Angeles uh, the Metropolitan Task Force on Human Trafficking that is nearly 100 members strong with law enforcement, both federal and local. Um, definitely immigration is a big part of that. So we work in D.C. with immigration, but we also work locally in the trenches. So we're protecting the survivors who deserve that so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I believe we have time for one more. I'll ask two, and you can choose which one you want to answer. Um, this is for Kay. One is I'm wondering what your sense is of the prevalence of trafficking um, destinations around the country, like, say, L.A. versus New York or other states. And also I'm wondering if you ever feel personally um, vulnerable because of your role. Yeah, very good question. <laughs> um, that's a great question. Uh, so the first is uh, the top three destination cities are, as I said before, L.A., New York, and Miami. That said, you know, we've had cases in Bakersfield. We've had uh, cases really all over the country, mostly urban centers, but also more, more and more rural. And to be honest with, with you, I think that if we did more outreach, especially in the agricultural um, industry, we would actually find more in rural areas too. So uh, this is kind of a, an emerging issue where if you look for it, we're going to find it. And we just need to develop the outreach strategies in order to do so. And that's why working in partnership with survivors is so critical, because who better to inform our outreach than someone who's experienced that? Um, the next question is, yeah, actually, sometimes I am a little bit afraid, to be honest with you. I'm a mom uh, to a seven-year-old, and 
Uh, I worry about uh, the threats. I mean, we are our business office, our shelter program, the wellness center. All of it is confidential in a confidential location. Um, and, you know, we do, we have had times when our staff, case managers in particular, um, are followed by traffickers or people that the traffickers hire. You know, traffickers are a very savvy, smart bunch, and they also have a lot of resources, a lot of money um, to protect them. And so as a community, our task is really to match that so that we are also um, rising up and not fearing it, because it's important to be mindful and cautious, but not to fear them. Uh, because survivors are really relying on us to liberate them. Thank you so much.